Hello, my most beloved and murderous horde, and welcome back. I am, of course, your mistress of murder, and you all by now know my son, Charlie. Say hello, Charlie. Well, well, well. Look who's back, my murderous horde. Our old friend, Jack the Ripper. It seems we may finally have a name for him now, according to new forensics DNA evidence that scientists have recently published for us. So without further to do, you know the drill by now, my lovelies. Pick your poison, sit back, relax, and let's have ourselves a little conversation. Now, according to this article by the USA Today, forensics evidence may have just proven who exactly the infamous Leather Apron, a.k.a. Jack the Ripper, truly is. A barber and Polish man by the name of Aaron Kuminski, who was one of the original suspects in the initial investigation. Now, I know this makes old Jackie boy sound like more of a Sweeney Todd, but I digress. Kuminski was a Polish Jewish man who immigrated from Congress Poland to England in the 1880s. He worked as a hairdresser in Whitechapel in the East End of London, where a series of murders ascribed to an unidentified figure named Jack the Ripper were committed in 1888. From 1891, our Kuminski was actually institutionalized in an insane asylum. Now, police officials from the time of the murders actually named one of their suspects as Kaminsky. However, the forename was not given and described him as a Polish Jew in an insane asylum. Almost a century after the final murder, the suspect Kaminsky, as identified as Aaron Kaminsky, but unfortunately, there is little, if any, evidence to connect Aaron Kaminsky with the same Kaminsky who was suspected of the murders and their dates of death are even different. It is possible that Kaminsky was confused with yet another Polish Jewish man of the same age, possibly named Aaron or David Cohen, real name being even possibly Nathan Kaminsky, the last names even spelled differently, an A instead of an O and a Y instead of the final I who was, in fact, a violent patient at the same insane asylum. However, R. Kaminsky's DNA, his semen to be exact, was found on a shawl of one of the murder victims, the killer's fourth victim to be exact, a one Catherine Edwos. Now, the shawl was found next to the body, and the DNA that was collected was genetically linked to Aaron Kaminsky's current living descendants. Pretty much an open and shut case, right? Well, not necessarily. I honestly have very mixed feelings about this conclusion, though I do mostly disagree with it for several reasons. The fact that it is entirely possible that Aaron Kaminsky could have been confused for another patient of a very similar name already is cause for doubt. Then, you then tack on the fact that during the time period, insane asylums across the globe were honestly piss-poor at best, and in all aspects, let alone keeping residents' names and their whereabouts straight due to the abysmal lack of staff in comparison to the explosive amount of residents held within them, let alone having competent or qualified staff and how it was common practice to falsify the documents of the patients to better suit the reputation of the asylum in the eyes of the public. Not to mention the other as numerous factors, such as the societal bias towards the mentally ill at the time, the lack of understanding of psychology as a whole, and a cornucopia of other things, which is honestly more than enough to already cast serious and reasonable doubt on the entire conclusion altogether. But I honestly have my own issues with this theory behind the Jack the Ripper case. Now, my first and major issue with it is that it is far beyond that of a barber or even a hairdresser's skill set to make the incisions that were used on the killer's victims. In fact, it has been long since suspected that the original profile for the Whitechapel murders was grossly incorrect. Now, this was due to the societal bias at the time 
where it was widely believed that no one of a higher social standing or of a higher intelligence or even more respected occupation would be capable of such crimes. This also applied to women for quite some time as well. Now, it was because of this that the original profile of the killer's occupation was thought to be of someone of a low social standing, such as a butcher or the like. Now, this list of occupations could have included a barber or hairdresser. However, I am not entirely sure on that matter. Now, this was actually later proven to be incorrect, as it would be by far beyond that of a butcher's skill, even a barber or hairdresser's skill, that the Ripper was clearly capable of. The second and lesser known profile was that the killer was not only foreign, which would apply to Kaminsky somewhat, as would the tools used to do the dismembering, which has been speculated to be a surgeon's scalpel, but due to the lack of forensic evidence available during the time, could also very easily have been a straight razor or a pair of scissors or anything used in that trade. Which would again fit the description of Kaminsky, but I would like to elaborate that the precision used on the victims' bodies, the fact that many of the victims were killed outside in London's dark and foggy streets, which would greatly uh, hinder uh, any killer's vision, coupled with how some of the victims' organs were even removed quite well and were even thrown about in some cases, would be by far outside of your average barber's skill set, though a butcher would possibly be capable of it if they were very well uh, skilled in their trade. Now, the second profile suggests that the killer may have in fact been a doctor or a mortician or someone of that trade, which would have possibly been anywhere between a middle class to maybe a lower, higher class social status. Which does bring me to my next issue with this conclusion. The pros and cons of the idea itself. You see, Kaminsky was living in Whitechapel at the time, which would have been beneficial to the killer for two main reasons. One being camouflage, and the other more so being that he would have known the area, and he would have known the area very well. However, this would have also been a hindrance to him, as a familiar face would have been recognized in the local haunts picking up the prostitutes. However, it would have also been beneficial for the killer to have also been foreign, as London at the time was a very overcrowded city and had an abundance of foreigners coming in and out at regular intervals. What does bring up a possible oddity is that the killer being local would have also given the killer a place to hide the evidence of their activities and to dispose of them very easily and on their own time. Now barbers at the time, if memory serves, were also known for their bloodletting and hairdressers as well, so seeing a barber with blood on them would not have been unthinkable, but it would not have been in the quantities that would have likely been present on the killer, which means that the killer would have either been very careful to not hint or give away their activities, or they would have been a local and would have been able to hide those activities very well within their own home. However, as I said, the area of London at the time, particularly the Whitechapel area, was very much overpopulated and full of immigrants. So it would have been also entirely possible for a foreign person to merely blend in with all the other nameless masses. It would have also been a hindrance as well, as usually they would have lived in very crowded homes and would have possibly been renting. However, him being a local would not have explained the n numerous witnesses that were unable to properly describe the killer as being a hairdresser or barber many clients would have had a very good look at this man and thus would have made it very easy for others to recognize him. However, this does not seem to be the case. With what the witness reports I could dig up, this is by far from reality. The description of the Ripper were vague at best and varied widely. Now, this isn't unheard of 
as the human brain is not a camera, and can be very easily manipulated into th remembering things that simply did not happen. In fact, when the human brain doesn't fully remember something, it can make up its own stories just to fill in the blanks using other memories that seem to kind of fit. This is also around the same concept of experiencing deja vu. Now, the killer being local, if it was possible, would have also known the area and possibly the victim's occupations very well. Now, this would allow the killer to know the schedules and routes of the officers in the area at the time. Now, I say that because at that time, there were not many officers on the streets in the areas, especially at night. And the way the police were expected to be in certain areas at certain times with decent spans of time for them to travel on foot to each location, a local would be very well aware of this and would be very well aware of the schedules that the police would be taking and would know where the police were and at what time they would be there and would be able to plan accordingly, especially if they had lived in the area for the while which would fit the Ripper's case and would also fit Kaminsky's. However, it would not be entirely impossible for a foreign killer or a foreigner to not only realize this, but also learn these schedules, as they ran like clockwork and could save it to memory in as little as a few weeks. Perhaps even less time would be needed if the killer was specifically looking for these patterns. The same basic logic could apply to the victims, as all of the victims, the chronological five, and the other six possible later victims. Now, I say chronological five along with a possible other six is because during that time period in the Whitechapel area and in the surrounding areas, there were 11 murders during this particular time period. However, only five of them could be conclusively linked to Jack the Ripper. Overall, the facts as I understand them seem to indicate that the idea of the Ripper being a local for any significant length of time does not entirely seem to fit the case in the Whitechapel murders beyond a reasonable doubt, so I will remain skeptical of it. I'm not saying it would be impossible, mind you, but it is as equally likely as it is unlikely. Now, the third issue I find in this conclusion are, in fact, the Saucy Jack letters. Now, these letters were just used to taunt the police, and only one, I do believe, if memory serves, was actually connected to Jack the Ripper himself. Now, analysis of these letters, i.e. the spelling of words, terms used, etc., would bring up the conclusion that the person who wrote them was likely not from the area due to two traits that were seen in the writing. One was the difference in spelling of certain words, as some of you may or may not be aware, that Americans spell certain words very differently than our British counterparts. A few examples being the words color, flavor, behavior, harbor, honor, humor, labor, neighbor, rumor, and splendor. Now, those are just naming a few. In the letters that are widely believed to be of written by the Ripper himself, the spelling used was concluded that it had been someone who was probably more used to the American English version of these words rather than the British version. Now, unless Kaminsky had learned to read or write in America, which I have found no evidence of, this would not have been the case, as it would have been by far more likely that Kaminsky would have been more familiar with the British version of the spellings of these words and similar words, rather than the Americans. So it was then later concluded that the person who at least wrote those letters was actually American, or had at least learned to read or write there. The other trait that I have found was the misuse or apparent unfamiliarity of the terms and slang that was used in Whitechapel at the time, which indicated again that the killer was not a local, or at the very least had not been in the area long enough to fully know and understand the terms, which in Kaminsky's case, who 
was at the time living in Whitechapel would have very likely known the local terms and slang and would not have made those oddities or errors in his writings. Now, I do digress on this point, however, as the letters are not considered substantial evidence in this case, and again, as only one of them is believed to have been written by Jack the Ripper, I, however, mention them as they do hold enough influence to indicate a reasonable doubt that Kaminsky is in fact the Ripper. Another doubt I have is the fact that the killing stopped, or at the very least, after the chronological five out of the possible eleven Ripper slayings, that the killer may have changed methods. This I find highly skeptical as Jack the Ripper showed many hallmark traits of a serial killer, one of which being the escalation in brutality, but more importantly showed an overall consistency in the method of killing. Humans by nature are creatures of habit and serial killers are no exception. In fact, they have often shown to be more susceptible to this trait than the masses. I would also like to note that there are two types of serial killers. There are the harder to catch ones and then there are the more I don't want to say run-of-the-mill, but for a lack of a better term. You see, there are serial killers that are much more difficult to catch and are of higher intelligence than their counterparts. And what one trait is that separates these two is that one serial killer, the harder to catch one, which would seemingly fit Jack the Ripper, actually would move the bodies away from the original crime scene. This actually makes it a lot harder to catch them even in today's era. However, Jack the Ripper was actually not one of these and in fact actually left his victims where he killed them, which would indicate more of a desire to kill and less of a ulterior motive, at least in my understanding of it. Now, when it comes to the method of killing and the consistency of it, as I said, humans are by nature creatures of habit. Now, this fits Jack the Ripper perfectly, as it is not often that a serial killer can change their methods, and those that do, as I said, are normally incredibly intelligent and are much harder to catch, which is kind of Jack the Ripper, but he did not seem to change his methods or even move the bodies. But it is more likely that the killings did stop, which in the Ripper's case, when considering the fact that the violence and even the locations of where the bodies were found drastically escalated in brutality and even once changed from the streets to being found in the victim's own home, clearly shows that the killer was growing bolder and more comfortable with their actions. These facts do not at all indicate that the killer would be willing or even be able to stop on their own. So why after the chronological five does it appear that the killings did indeed stop? Well, there could be a few reasons to that. The killer died, the killer was incarcerated or was physically unable to continue killing, or the killer changed their hunting grounds or left the area entirely, which honestly, two of those would fit the idea of Kaminsky being the Ripper and the idea that the Ripper was foreign to the area and had simply left the area. But my main issue with the conclusion to this 100-year-old cold case is the evidence itself that tied our Polish barber and hairdresser to the case in the first place. Yes, I will say that DNA evidence is rather concrete, and I won't disagree that it is very solid and reasonable evidence to be sure. However, my issue lies in the also very reasonable fact that all of the proven victims, the chronological five of the Ripper, were in fact prostitutes. Now, I do not say that to imply any moral standing of any kind. I am only saying that finding semen on a prostitute's clothing is kind of like finding a corpse in the graveyard. You expect it almost to the point that the absence of it would be more of a substantially greater shock than its presence there. It's just kind of like putting a hat on a hat. Now, to be completely frank, I would imagine that due to the area's poverty, that the washing of clothes did not happen as often as it may have been needed. 
In fact, due to the time period and if memory serves, this applied not only to the washing of clothing, but to the most basic hygiene standards as well. Now, I could honestly go on and list a plethora of reasons one would find semen on the shawl of a prostitute, everything from Kaminsky being a John to a possible assault or the like, and yes, even to Kaminsky being the killer himself. The point is, is that while it would sound as if finding his DNA at the crime scene on the victim's clothing sounds like the proverbial slam dunk, there are a lot of factors that would easily provide a reasonable doubt in today's standards. Now, I know like I'm sounding like a defense attorney for Kaminsky, truly. But, in conclusion, do I believe that Aaron Kaminsky is in fact the true identity of the infamous Jack the Ripper? Not completely. I believe it may be possible, but I am not comfortable enough to fully embrace it as fact and close this case once and for all. In fact, I have another hypothesis entirely. I think it may be possible that there was more than one Ripper. Now, I say that because of the not only changing in killing methods, but also because of the brutality and how it escalated. That does not indicate someone who is willing to stop or is even capable of stopping. And not only that, but also that the name, the first name, could have been entirely different as well as the fact as there was another killer in the area who would have been capable of those slaughters. There was 11 possible victims. Only five were considered to be from the same person. What if, and I'm just saying, just an idea, what if there was more than one? What if we hit the proverbial murderous lottery, and had two serial killers, both with very similar methods of killing, both capable of such horrific events in a very similar area at the same time. Now, my theory is not the best. I would give a conservative guess that there was two different killers whose hunting grounds and victims of choice may have overlapped. Now, as I said, this is not the best nor the most likely theory, but it isn't impossible. As you see, my horde, there was, in fact, another killer that we also know very well. A one Herman Webster Mudgett, a.k.a. Dr. H.H. H. Holmes, who would not only be able to easily perform such killings would be capable of doing so and intelligent enough to use the methods that the Ripper used to avoid capture and would also very much fit the second profile of the Ripper. On top of that, the Ripper, being H.H. H. Holmes, would have also fit very well into the Saucy Jack letters as he was an American, would have been familiar with the American way of spelling, and was also a bit of a show-off. He was a chauvinist. He loved to brag. And was also even a pathological liar. Now, I will say that it is very unlikely. However, H.H. H. Holmes also had not just one, but two of his known aliases recorded, both entering and leaving the Whitechapel area very close to both the start and stopping dates of the Whitechapel slayings. Holmes, as I said, was also a bit of a show-off and would have likely taken great joy in taunting the police and flaunting his success. Overall, my most beloved and murderous horde, I do not honestly believe that we will ever know for sure who the Ripper truly was, but I do very much enjoy where this rabbit hole has taken us so far. And I can only hope that one day we can finally know all that occurred on those very gruesome nights in Whitechapel, London, 1888.